So that takes us to our first discussion. Let's talk about the world that cryptocurrency people are trying to build. What are the different social, political, and economic aspirations of the cryptocurrency community? And why is money so central to those ambitions? We have a great slate of guests joining us for this discussion. Uh, welcome to Garrick Heilman, head of research at blockchain.com, and Brody, who is doing a PhD at McGill University, and Tessie Moraine, the co-founder of Liquality and director of Global Product and Innovation at Consensus. Welcome all. Thanks, June. Garrick, uh, you and I worked together uh, at Coindesk in the early days, many, many years ago, in the distant past of, uh, of cryptocurrencies. And, and you used to talk about this idea that central banks would accumulate Bitcoin as a hedge. Can you just tell us, are we closer or further away from that world today? You know, I think I think we're closer. And, you know, I know John, you know, Paul Tudor Jones has been in the news recently with his investment. He made, I thought, an important point, which is that every day that Bitcoin, you know, kind of continues to exist, it gets stronger, it becomes more credible. And so some in some way, you know, every passing day that, you know, crypto is still here, Bitcoin is still here. There's a step closer to the day where it's a more widely uh, held asset. Uh, because it enhances its credibility, its perceived durability, and so on. And, um, you know, there's, depending upon how you define a central bank, um, you know, there's there's likely governments slash central banks that today hold some crypto, some maybe not for as legitimate reasons. I mean, we, we believe that, for example, you know, the North Korean government may be involved in hacking and may hold some crypto as part of that. Um, you know, there's speculation around Venezuela and other countries, but, you know, there's various reasons why central banks might want to hold it. That's a much longer conversation we could go into. Um, I think we're still, though, to be clear, though, a ways away from a, um, you know, Federal Reserve or European central bank from, from holding Bitcoin. I think that day is still quite, quite uh, far into the future. And just as a quick follow-up question there, does it matter how central banks come to hold cryptocurrencies? You know, for example, uh, we just had the halving, which obviously is the, uh, a, a reduction in the, in the mining subsidy for, uh, for securing the Bitcoin network. Um, and there have been rumors that, for example, North Korea uh, is mining Bitcoin, right? So does it matter whether it's, um, you know, they're buying cryptocurrencies in the open market or they're mining cryptocurrencies themselves. Is, does that make a difference? I think it absolutely does. The intention around why a government or, or anyone owns a cryptocurrency is very important. Uh, you know, governments have owned cryptocurrency because they seize them through law enforcement operations. So more and more governments have become used to taking possession or managing, at least temporarily, the ownership of cryptocurrency. Um, I think most governments tend to sell relatively quickly their cryptocurrencies. There's some discussion that maybe Bulgaria might hold a significant, significant quantity of Bitcoin. That's, uh, I don't think, entirely clear from what I know. Um, but if you're mining it, if you're seizing it, if you're, as the researchers affiliated with the Barbados uh, Central Bank suggested, buying it for investment purposes uh, to actually boost the value of, of uh, reserves, I mean, I think these different reasons are absolutely important uh, to understanding kind of what happens with central bank or government ownership of, of crypto assets. Uh, you know, mining would be, I think, a pretty amazing uh, step uh, forward. I mean, that would, to me, signal that governments really saw this as a strategic, uh, you know, uh, asset of importance and needed to have some kind of significant um, presence in the space beyond just wanting to invest or hedge for currency for X reasons, that would be, I think, kind of, you know, maybe maybe the ultimate uh, step in endorsement and legitimization of crypto, crypto assets. I want to shift um, to a bit of a broader question here and ask you both about kind of the more utopian aspirations of the industry. And I mean, most people assume that sort of the industry's aspirations are by and large utopian. Um, 
And as someone who works on Ethereum, Tessie, would you agree with that? Are you seeing a lot of sort of techno utopian aspirations um, in that crowd? Um, number one, I wouldn't say there is one industry. Um, there's no agreement across the board that we all have the same goal, right? There's enterprise uh, blockchain, which is looking to gain efficiency. So um, putting that aside and looking at what I consider the real blockchain, um, the public, for example, public Ethereum blockchain that is building out a trust layer, benefiting the applications that are built on top and allowing for secure transactions that way. Um, enabling, for example, supply chain tracking, which we have already in production. I actually worked on this, the first project that was going into production for supply chain or um, self-sovereign identity, all these kind of models that we have started to build out. Um, it's not utopian. It's already in existence. The question is, is it being used or should it be used at this point? But definitely we see the future um, at the horizon uh, by building the foundations. And as a, as a follow up to that, I mean, some people would look at, you know, sort of blockchain ideas about trust, um, how you're treating kind of everybody as a potential attacker or enemy, no one can be trusted as dystopian. Do you have any thoughts on that? Sure. Um, if you look at uh, the internet, for example, right, it's very, um, you know, historically, we can compare that. And um, the internet was the um, revolution in communication. And um, it brought us, you know, the extension of uh, communication to be able to globally interact and communicate. And it brought a lot of uh, democracy towards um, information and uh, information asynchrony. But on the other hand, also, it brought us um, data mining. It brought us loss of privacy. And if you look at um, the dystopian version of that for blockchain, that would mean, for example, um, all the things we do, I mean, usually the, the best is also very closely related to the worst, right? The goal is right next to the opposition. And um, so uh, the dystopian aspect here would be um, that the other side of the solution um, is, um, you know, in, in the solution is actually in the other hand, for example, right? So that your data is being tracked and not being forgotten ever, that mistakes follow you around forever, that reward systems, reward legacy um, uh, values, uh, top-down powers, and that uh, identities fail the individual. So the other side of blockchain can be the dystopian log engine um, solidifying inequalities as we have them already. And we're now joined by Anne Brody here, who was earlier having a little bit of technical difficulty. Welcome, Anne. Hi, thank you so much. Hi, and, sorry about that. <laughs> no worries. We're actually just talking about something that you study, um, which is sort of yep. the assumption that there are some more kind of techno utopian aspirations in the industry. But um, if I recall correctly, you actually, you disagree with this. Yeah. Um, of course, it also depends on the crypto cryptocurrency or blockchain uh, community that you're looking at. But uh, my research specifically deals with Ethereum. And um, based on uh, just my observations of and, and participant observation with the Ethereum community, I find that the developers themselves, um, they're not necessarily techno utopian, uh, but because um, you know, blockchain cultures, they, it's still a hacker culture and a hacker culture is predicated on this like engineering ethos that is very um, committed to this excellency in their work. Um, and I think that in terms of their future outlook uh, for blockchain and the, their, their visions for it, I think there's a very pragmatic outlook um, on it. And they're very uh, aware of the challenges that that face them um, based on just like talking to them. They, they were really, um, they're very adamant on expressing that blockchain is nowhere near where it's supposed to be. That, um, you know, there's so many issues that are still, there still need to be fixed and still need to be thought out better. And that the community itself is not perfect. I mean, there's like a lot of these uh, themes of diversity that keep coming up. Um, which is very different from, you know, the Bitcoin community, which I found places less emphasis on um, 
themes related to diversity and uh, equity and equality. You know, this, uh, this reminds me of the Ursula Le Guin quote. Uh, she wrote, you know, every utopia contains a dystopia and every dystopia contains a utopia. Um, just to turn back to Garrick here uh, and, and playing off sort of Anne's findings, you know, if what kind of a world is it if we're living in a world where, um, you know, governments, treasuries or central banks are accumulating, for example, Bitcoin um, as a chaos hedge, right? Even um, Paul Tudor Jones's uh, sort of investment logic is that because fiat currency is, is becoming so sort of debased, that's why we want to buy, uh, he wants to buy Bitcoin. Um, so is that, are we actually headed towards this dystopian world now where, where cryptocurrencies become, you know, the thing that we hold and the way that we transact? Yeah, it's a great, great question, June. And, and uh, you know, one of my great fears, and it's, you know, not just me, you know, regulators uh, have identified one of the key risks around the existence of crypto assets is that hedge funds, uh, large ones like Paul Tudor Jones, get over invested and overexposed and fuel you know a big bubble that crashes uh and creates systemic risk for the financial system um hedge funds are plugged into banks banks are systemically important you know you could see in an environment like we have today with you know limited maybe financial investment opportunities some would argue crypto being quite attractive and being a victim of its own success potentially, where there's a manic, you know, rise into a level that is deemed uh, material from a systemic risk perspective, like a trillion plus asset class, and um, you know, crypto exacerbating the next great crisis in some ways because there is this kind of exit ramp, uh, you know, that that you know, hedge funds and others can 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 flee into. I, I very much worry about that. Um, and to your point, I think, um, you know, you know, I, th I think, you know, a transition to a more blockchain decentralized cryptocurrency centric financial system has to occur steadily over time if it is, you know, the right thing to occur. I mean, I think that's still a question that uh, we're all we're, we're all kind of wrapping our heads around and, 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 you know, groping to understand better, you know, what is this new world we're heading towards? Is it better than the one we live in now? You know, there's still a lot of data that we we just don't have around ownership concentration levels across crypto assets. Uh, you know, they um, from a Gini coefficient perspective, uh, some of them can be very tightly owned. Uh, you know, and, and that raises a lot of important social, you know, uh, you know, economic equality questions, and so on and so forth. So, there's lots of really I think important questions here to understand around you know, kind of the community that's owning crypto assets, you know, are we seeing dispersion, more and more people owning, there is data that in Bitcoin's case suggests that's true, that's becoming less and less concentrated. I think that's actually very healthy, very important even to, to its success and existence. And uh, just briefly here, we're clock's winding down a little bit, guys, but I'm quite curious to hear your thoughts on um, sort of more equality related issues. And Tessie, I want to ask you first, because you're the co-founder of Laquality, which is a peer-to-peer -peer exchange, and you started the women in blockchain community, as well as um, you were part of the Occupy Wall Street movement. Um, and you've argued that decentralization has the potential to create more equality. And uh, do you think the industry has lived up to this potential so far? Um, yes, in many ways. Um, again, um, blockchain can provide the trust layer needed for decentralization to move uh, agency from the institutions to the individuals, right? And um, for example, Bitcoin, uh, which was the first application on the blockchain, is an alternative to money. It's decentralized, it's censorship resistant, and it's transparent, and it's peer-to-peer. -peer. No bank needed. So that alone is revolutionary. And, you know, in the early... Bitcoin days, lots of nerds got rich. And so also a lot of, um, you know, uh, inequality was resolved that way. The money moved to uh, different groups. Um, that's, of course, a very idealistic view of that uh, because there is concentration of wealth, as Garrick already uh, mentioned. Um, now, looking at the Ethereum community, for example, um, 
the Ethereum community is building circular economies, it's building DAOs, um, decentralized autonomous organizations that allow quickly uh, to start uh, organizations and come together and fund uh, towards a common goal um, and builds in general applications that take advantage of that trust layer that blockchain provides. Um, there are about 1.7 billion people unbanked today. And I would like to see all of these people being able to be part of the economy, uh, not necessarily by being banked, right? So we built that alternative to that. And that will create, um, you know, greater equality because it will help the individual. For example, people can access decentralized finance products like atomic loans or compound. And then, for example, equality, as you mentioned, uh, my project uh, bridges Bitcoin and Ethereum blockchains and allows unintermediated permissionless exchange peer-to-peer. -peer. So peer-to-peer -peer is a really um, big factor here. And so, yes, we are working on the infrastructure and the protocols to enable uh, this unintermediated access and interoperability between the systems and between um, the ecosystems and blockchains and between the communities. But I only talked about the applications. There are also so many other initiatives in this space, uh, which are also part of, um, you know, reaching equality. There are global hackathons, for example. There was a um, blockchain for social impact coalition incubator recently. So where teams globally come together and work, um, you know, on solutions. In this case, it was um, about environment, right? So um, there are the social factors. There are the um, technology factors. And um, does that resolve um, racism or discrimination? No. I mean, of course, the society is still also reflected in technology. And, you know, it's a male-dominated field, a white male-dominated field. Um, will that have to change? Yes. Will that be something that can be mediated by technology and help, um, you know, balance? Yes, so th there is this shift back and forth between education and, um, you know, building technology and adoption um, that we have to watch out for. And no, it's not perfect at all, but we are on the way. Tessie, thanks, thanks for that comment. Um, and thank you to all our guests, Garrick and Tessie, for joining us uh, on this show. Um,